Yeah, neither did I until I started making this video. Okay. It's coming to me as I talk to you. Okay, record of the genealogy of Jesus. Genesis. Genealogy in English comes from Genesis. Genesis. Okay, the Greek name that the Septuagint authors applied to the book. All right, now, our next thing that happens is we find out a whole lot of personality going on here if we do what the laconic style is silently, quietly, unobtrusively begging us to do. It's begging us to say, why are these words here? Why are you telling us this story? God is starting a movie here, and he just starts the movie. He doesn't tell you why, and he doesn't tell you what to think about it. He just plays the movie. And that's what Matthew is doing here. He just plays the movie. So you're supposed to ask, well, why? why what is this movie, and why, why are these facts here? What does it tell us? Well, in Genesis, we're being introduced to the Godhead. Okay? you got one God here, Jesus Christ. You find that out in Isaiah 45, 18, and 19 who's doing the creating of the, of the heaven and the earth. Then there's this lapse of time, you can't see that in English, and now we're introduced to the Holy Spirit restoring the earth. That's the second God. And then we're introduced to Father, and God says, see, he's chairman of the board, he does all, he makes all the orders. Okay, and there was light, is the light being made by the Holy Spirit, because he's on earth just brooding. It says brooding, really, it's brooding like a mother hen in the Hebrew. Okay? So, in the first three verses, we're introduced to each member of the Godhead. That's classical classical drama introduction. You know, cast the, the characters in order of appearance. Okay? In order of appearance, the Son first, because the book is about the man. Beginning to see how this laconic style has a lot of hidden irony and humor in it. And, oh, you know, there's a hiatus to earth that became uh, tohu wabohu. Formless and void is tohu wabohu in the Hebrew, and it means trashed up wasteland. Okay? And now we got the Holy Spirit restoring it like he's going to restore us. Ah! God isn't telling you all that meaning in the verse, but see how, it, how you can prove it's there? And then God the Father, who does all the orders, chairman of the board, let there be light. And then Holy Spirit makes light. It says light be, actually. This this here says light be. And therefore, light is. That's what it really means. Okay? And then this is Father approving the light. Okay? And separating light from darkness means that's another order. Okay? And then here's Father naming it. And naming the darkness. You see? So what you find here just by this little movie playing in the first five verses of Genesis is how the Godhead interacts with each other. They're all equal. But they choose to do for each other three-way gifting. You see that? They're interacting corporately. Trinity is a corporation. Okay? Matthew is doing the same thing, but his humor now is focusing on the human side. Okay, and here, you have to know what these w names mean in order to get the humor. Okay, Dawid means beloved. Abraham means father of many nations. Isaac means laughter. There are other meanings too besides these. I'm just picking one of the meanings. Okay, Yaakov means chiseler. Okay, Yuda is kingly, kingly tribe. Okay, there are other meanings here. Perez means struggle hardship. Zara means seed. You see, so if you know the names, if you know the names, then this is a very funny story. Jesus, Jesus is uh, the, the Greek version of Joshua. It means God is my salvation. Yah, Shua. Okay, Shua means salvation. Yah means God. Okay, God is my salvation. All right, or God is salvation, technically. Okay, Mashiach means the same thing, anointed one technically. Okay, so God is my salvation, the genealogy of God is my salvation, the anointed one, the son of beloved, who is the son of father of many nations. Now, if you were to translate instead of just transliterate these names and you read this, it becomes rather in interesting. 
And I'm going to leave you to look up those names because the Bible style is laconic here and it expects you to analyze the text. Okay? Now there's another reason for laconic writing in, in any kind of literature, including here, that I, I need to cover and then I think I'll close the video. Oops, I'm already at 16 minutes. Um, laconic writing is done when the event or the topic you're going to cover is so dramatic that the only way to heighten the drama is to drop words. That's a feature of Greek language which we saw in the first video, the first episode. It's ellipsis. Ellipsis is used in a lot of languages for the same reason. You drop words to stress the dramatic nature of what you're saying. So laconic writing has that purpose also. It's so dramatic that to put more words in there like, oh, Agamemnon, blah, 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 woe is me, blah, blah, blah. That's a form of drama, but it's kind of boring. You know, it's melodramatic to us. It wasn't to the Greeks. They liked that kind of nonsense. All right. But when you say, my mother died. Okay? You don't add any details. You, it's too dramatic to you. You just state the facts then that's the highest way of expressing a dramatic event. My mother died. 9-11. Terrorism. You see how that, that's punchy? Okay. And it's a, a way of understating the drama because you can't overstate it. So you resort to dropping words. You resort to laconic speech like here. And why, why is that so dramatic? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God married Finity when he did that. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to put up with us. Why should he bother to have creation? Creation is a pain in the neck. There's nothing we can do for him. Why do you do this? And it, the, the reasons why he did it are so dramatic, he doesn't state them at all. Instead, he shows the reasons right here. God, God the Son, first actor on stage, interacting, creating. And then we have a hiatus, and you, you're introduced to God the Holy Spirit. And this is God moving around, not really moving, but it, it's, it, the, the word is rachef, and it means to hover like a mother over her chicks. In other words, he's looking at it. He's looking at the trashed up earth. And then Father talks. So this is all God to God interaction here. That's why. That's why God did it. It's a way of three way gifting. And how do you express that drama? Just tell just show what they do. There's you cannot there aren't enough words to express the drama of the fact that they're interacting with each other in love. This is their gift to each other, obviously, because it's one God doing it here, another God doing it here, and another God doing it here. So they're interacting with each other, because each God could do the whole thing himself. See how analyzing the text gives you a lot more meaning? Same thing here, okay? All these generations, yaddy, 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 just goes on and on and on and on. Okay, and then he gets to his climactic statement, 14, 14, and 14. He doesn't tell you why he's using 14. You're expected to know. Just like God isn't telling you why he created here, you're expected to know. You're either expected to know as you read, or you're expected to know because you read. In other words, this is, this is information everybody already knew. So it's not new information to them. Same thing here. It's not new information to the reader. It's just being put down in writing. So you're either expected to already know the answer, so there's no point in elaborating on it, or you're expected to figure it out as you read. That's what we do. Because we weren't there at the time these books were written. Everybody else already knew the information. We didn't. We only know it through the Bible. Okay, so why is Matthew using 14, 14, and 14? Well, because his letter is about 
the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And who covered the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 covered it with a decree. You can see my Isaiah 53 videos. And in that decree, he uses 42 syllables. Now, Isaiah 53 is supposed to be memorized by the Jews. So he's not going to sit there and remind them, Hi, I'm talking about Isaiah 53. He's only going to remind them of the number of syllables. Because the decree for Christ's birth is in 42 syllables to the Jews. So Matthew is talking about the Jewish generation of Christ. See? Jesus the Messiah. These are Jewish words. All of them are Jewish words. Which, you know, every reader who is a Jew knows what these words mean. Okay? So they're getting a lot of they're getting a lot of information out of the names. How Christ got here? Well, he got here through struggle. He got here through seed. He got here through laughter. He got here through father of many nations. He got here through beloved. And that gives you a description of the history of what it took to get him here. Bet you didn't think that the genealogy was that important, huh? Yeah. So now I hope I've given you some ideas about what to do with laconic writing. Whenever you read the Bible, always ask, whether it's in translation or not, why are these words worded the way they are? And if it's laconic speech, count on it. The reason why is you're supposed to analyze the text. And as you can see, you can sit down and analyze this very simple text. And you can come up with some pretty profound understandings. Bye.